So can I start now? Right, thanks. Um, hi, I'm Harris from Natural History Museum London, and probably you have seen some of my colleagues before already. And so it's like, I'm so sorry, I'm not actually here for talking anything about a publication, but actually digitization, like label extraction, auto extraction from uh, some sort of like machine learning approach. And luckily it's still knowledge graph. And <laughs> like for, um, for some previous talk that from my colleagues, Wins and Ben, uh, Ben did actually introduce our really fancy no robot arm and like Alex from Wins. But like the things that we always mention in our talk is about the specimen digitization like difficulties. And actually it's like each individual specimen are actually represents quite like complex labels and also like the information like complexity that we always need to take about like in our biodiversity domain. So one problem says for storing this sort of image, like the records like related information is actually data silos. So each individual's institutions will probably will actually have like uh, different versions about the same specimen data. So one of them like possibly um, uh, so the bottom one is actually showing that it's like, okay, so this is a standard uh, possible, the right one about the, the records, the label transcription, but in different institutions, probably they will get their names wrong or maybe their country is not wrong, or even though with our ID that we do actually have some of the cases in email data set. And it's like sometimes like for geographic locations, because it probably will actually depend on the way they actually uh, rec like record and transcribe the location. So it probably will become maybe some of the, some of the institution they would do, uh, for example, uh, a donor shape around an island to, to identify the marine, like marine like specimen, but some of them just like do a single, a single circle. So it probably will actually have some of the island inside a circle. So for this, some sort of things like this actually some sort of will cause actually inconsistence, inconsistency about our data records and the labels, our transcriptions. And this will actually bring the di uh, digitization process a more even devil level. So is it possible to actually have some sort of like a global data like knowledge base that actually would try to providing suggestions or maybe recommendations on collecting the digitizations like process or even like more for the transcription process? So in last year Tech Week, um, I did actually present a machine learning model. It's about like, how to use a graph theory in machine learning and the artificial intelligence area to try to do some sort of like data playing. So then try to like, what the second one is actually, it's like the brief introduction about it. I will not actually uh, put any equation anymore because I last year I got feedback, like why you put, actually put some more like quite a lot of math, mathematical equation in your slides and I would do, never do it. So it's like <laughs> the, I, this like the, a really brief idea is like about the graph theory and graph convolutional network. It's basically that's like it will actually like have the ability to recognize the entity automatically. So it's actually basically a classification like process about a node entity in a heterogeneous graph. Simultaneously, for further process, it will actually provide a link prediction ability. So it means. Sometimes probably that you don't actually need to know that two entities are actually linked, but our graph model will be able to predict one. So it will probably like provide a probability saying there's a, okay, it looks like that this collector actually did travel to this country. So he probably that will be a collector or a creator of one particular species, especially this will happen for island cases both of the time. And is it working? Oh yeah, right, sorry. Um, for after the last year, we actually come out an idea about whether it's possible to link the whole process from our knowledge graph to the data like aggregations and quality control surface, also our, our digitizations and transcriptions process. Because 
natural history museum in London do actually have 80 million of specimen, and this is actually bring us a really really huge challenge to do digitizations and transcription. So it's fairly impossible for us to, especially for our 40 people like the DDI team, to finish the job maybe probably in the next four, five, four or five hundred years. So this is impossible. And so it's like we start like thinking about like linking all these type of things together. So with the knowledge base, as I mentioned it, if it actually can predict like missing labels automatically. So it probably that it can actually accelerate this process and make sure that our data controls is always on the scale. And this is kind of like a knowledge support, and we are not aiming to replace anyone like in our domain. So we are we need to clarify that because artificial intelligence it can't be one hundred percent correct for all the cases. And it's like so, <laughs> so it's like we just want to say it's like, it's like we are not here for a machine learning background, like not replacing anyone. <laughs> And so it's like, uh, I would basically try to like, explain the, is this? Yeah. Um, the, yeah, knowledge graph like structure. And we actually managed to have a chance to cooperate the uh, technical giants, AWS. So it's like we actually designed a knowledge graph structure together. And this is actually, we will actually have a specimen and actually have a person, which is a, can be a collector, and so sometimes more probably creator, but most of the cases it's a collector, and, so it's like, and also it's the taxonomy, then that is some things like I think probably we can use to link to the publication part, because like the taxonomy always have an ID that actually can link to all the metadata. Currently, our knowledge graph doesn't actually have the scale to cover the all the publication records. I would explain to you in the next few slides why it's not happening currently. And so we do actually have institution records and country records, and we list all of our like uh, resource like open open or absolutely open source like uh support on this on the screen as well so we do actually have wikipedia uh wikidata like baronomio have index like uh, gbiv and like um GSI code. and the reason why that we only having gbiv here and not the rest is actually this is only a, a poc le uh, level so we are only concentrating on the uh, herbarium a spreadsheet like at the moment. So sorry for anyone from the other domain. Sorry about that. And here's come to the reason why we are actually not currently taking any publication is because just only for the occurrence in the, uh, the botanical spreadsheet domain, we already have like 106 million records. And for our POC level, it's a little bit tricky to cover the publication detail as well, because the metadata is like even probably like double the scale or even larger, or maybe hundreds of times. And we actually cover like 1.9 million so about the taxons and it's like institutions, like it's actually around 8,000. And for the country number, it's like it's 252 now. And for the people, I will explain it later. And we did actually have a really quick test on like uh, testing on the maybe t around one, th uh, one, one tenth about the currency. So it's around like 10 millions of specimen records like from GBIT, like on the AWS slide surface. It approximately take 23 hours to import the, and generating the whole graph and to do the training. And, but running the query just one second would be enough, approximately less than that. And it's, and the result is pretty good. It can actually got like around maybe 80% of the accuracy about doing the, at least the entity classification. So for the people, um, this come to a really, like struggling problem is about the collector names disambiguation. 
So this actually caused a nightmare for me and my colleague Ben. <laughs> like for doing, like generating a standard standardized data set that can be used, like for doing this POC on the knowledge graph. And we actually tried to aggregate the Wikidata um, collect, uh, botanical collector records and hub index and binomials. And all of the number listed here is actually the number of records we aggregated. And the left things, the, the, the leftist things is actually uh, what actually that we extracted from the open source. So as you can see, there's actually the, the columns of the entity, so which means it's actually the attributes of about the collector are not equally the same in different open sources. So it means so for even those are for the collector records, for the name like and their biograph themselves, it actually stores differently in different open data source. So this is some sort of like another type of data silos. So we did try to run a couple of tests and make sure that this process can be like auto-generated the data set. And so we did try to run with like quite a lot of like different machine learning models from really traditional one, the treasure one, to a little bit more fancier ones. It's actually the ECM or maybe the K-means that which is unsupervised and some logistic regression and SVMs and the night base, which is a classic um, supervised learning. And we did try to use different distance measurements like between like the strings as well um, from Jarrow codes or Jarrow's and uh, Livingston. And absolutely, we actually have a few more, but I don't actually have any space here. And it's like for the feature, we do actually have tried a couple of them and for different combinations as well. And Finally, we figure out a combination that we think would be reasonable to upscale the overlap between this all three data sets from 40% to 60%. I know it's not really good now, but it's like it's much better than at least more than 50%. So if anyone actually have any recommendations for us to improve this process, please contact us after the talk. And so it's like um, the F measures like for all this testing actually drop into the range of 0 0.6 to 0 0.82. So I think this is still reasonable because but we finally choose the 0 0.8 through one. So no worry. So the F1, F1 score is still convincing. So finally, we actually now have the planetary knowledge base like service sit in the AWS ecosystem. So what it can do, first of all, we are happy to absorb all the open, these open source data that can, we can try to write a script or the, the, uh, the auto pipeline to try to convert those of the things into a standard data set of botany collectors and institutions. But this will actually require probably some help from all the people from our domain. And another thing is actually for transcriptions. So we mentioned this, we are not actually here for replacing anyone. So our planetary knowledge rate cloud service is actually aimed to like uh, provide knowledge supports to transcribe transcriptor. So it will actually provide in kind of like um try to uh, like let them know that probably okay, so the, the current one will actually have some sort of like related information. So kind of a recommendation system and try to, and it would be really great that if later we can try to manage to link our taxonomy ID with the publications. So when the transcriptor really want to try to look through the literature and the library records, it will actually have a better job. Because I, I, I did actually have like comments from a transcriptor transcri from our museum. Uh, he used to actually have like sitting in the library for maybe five hours just to find the records to make sure the uh, transcriptor, the trans transcription is 100% wrong, 100% correct. Like for that really, really weird bilingual specimen record. <laughs> so it would be really great that actually we later actually have the publication function with things, but for current stage, like we are still working on it. And the next one would definitely be the um, 
uh, auto collection, uh, auto corrections about outside the digitization and also, also the possible recommendation list for doing the correction. Cause, uh, as Wins mentioned it in the Alice and Ben mentioned it in the, in the robotic arms, we do have, uh, natural history rooms actually currently have quite a lot of like auto process, but OCR, even though that Google Vision commit to actually have really high accuracy about their hand written like, uh, transcription, but that's not actually like high enough for making this record to be stored in our, for example, Herbarium HB, uh, BHL. So, so like we kind of like using this to actually provide a double check like for either transcri transcriptor and also digitizer to make sure it's like, okay, so after the, uh, our fancy machine job, probably that's it's saving more time for them to do a double check. The last one is actually something from an institution perspective, because we all know that like, um, we do actually have some sort of like re re identification and re 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 determination. Sorry, what I'm doing? <laughs> Redetermination things like uh, after maybe a couple of years or maybe some times for a new species discovery. And this is all can be done from a uh, specimen record analysis. So what we are aiming for is we hope that like the planetary knowledge base will actually do kind of like uh, all tools like filterings for like the creator. So that's like it can actually save them some time. This, um, the reason why this can be, can be done is actually for graph theory. Sometimes the graph theory actually will actually have some sort of cases, what we call detected error, but the detected error is actually can be an outliner, but an outliner in machine learning probably is an error, but if in biodiversity domain, it probably can be either error or just a new, new species dis discovery. And this is really important for like our creator. So this is basically the full picture about our knowledge graph service. So it's like, and it's what we now we actually have a new name for it. So it's like the planetary knowledge base is really fancy and it will be actually sitting with AWS. And by the way, I forgot to name one of the things because I few slides ago, mm, sorry about that. On the left, it's actually the code slide output slide from our AWS team. I need to annotate it to make sure that I credit them. <laughs> yeah. And that's everything, oh, sorry, for my talk. And sorry, I still haven't actually managed to make it short. And thanks, Ben Sor, like for helping us like doing the all the data preparations and like also like Ben did actually help us to convert the people aggregation pipeline into a Luigi script, and we will probably publish it in the futures maybe after the holiday. And it's like and thanks, Wins, like for supervising us, and also thanks our AWS partnerships like Ilan, Nishan, and Sam. They are the architect and machining specialists from AWS. And that's everything. Thank you. So this was our last talk, but we have some, some time for comments, discussions to this and also to the other talks. Yeah. So I've got a question for you. Um, did you just use um, Wikidata, the Harvard Index, and Binomia, or did you actually go and attempt to try and find other sources for people names? Um, we did actually try to find different sources because we did actually send a couple of emails to different different open source because once we actually want to put it into AWS like ecosystem, we need to make sure they're happy, like allow us to do it. We did actually send it to, I don't want to say, but it's like, we did actually send to send a TL2 and also Tropical, but they are not replying us. <laughs> but, so, yeah. so we, but we are actually quite happy. And that's the reason why I'm presenting here. So we are really happy to like, obtains like quite a lot of like uh, and absorbs like open source and maybe data sets from people that actually can like allow us to actually plug into our knowledge knowledge graves. And and do you up, I'm assuming you would update it because I'm working on those yeah, three things exactly. all the time. 
Yeah, yeah. exactly. We so so that's the reason why we actually convert the data aggregations like uh, auto pipeline into a uh, pipeline. It's just make sure that it's actually repeatable and we can actually rerun it like for uh, maybe a at least a month or something. And another really good thing is like is actually GBIF always actually have its inner build connection to the AWS. So it means it's actually saved quite a lot about the carbon footprints. So we mentioned this like we already have like 10 million record actually in the in in our testing environment, but this is not actually costing any extra footprints to actually uploading a data because like JBIT regularly synchronize it with AWS. Thank you. No worry. Yeah, Nikki. Yeah. Yeah. So just Hi, uh, so, so I don't know much about the um, assignment of name or, or other type of entities. So but you report like 60, 80 um, F1 or, or something like that. But in practice, uh, what a human would achieve or, or what? So, so uh, is it a binary classification? If it's a binary classification, then 60% is not so good. Also, can you provide some insight? Also, how many classes could be possible? Or you know, there are a few things I, that are missing from, from the presentation, I would say. Oh, so the F1 is just like, because we actually have three different like, people data set. So what we are aiming for is try to find like whether we can actually find a collector that actually can be matches. So some of the collector will only possibly exist in one or two data sets, but not like all of them. So the F1 score here is like, I know it's a little bit ambiguous. So, but what we are aiming to is trying to find um, uh, to create a, a data set that for collector that can be covered like for um, at least this collector is it should be exist in the final data set but like actually have references to the the about three at least ones is it making sense yeah yeah okay in a sense for me it would have been easier if you would have designed this as a ranking task because you could have collector one is a candidate, collector two is a candidate, collector yeah. three, and and if you would design this as a ranking test, then oh, you that's that the ranking test is actually the treasure one. Okay, okay, yeah. thank you very much. No worry. Yeah, Nikki. I wondered if you've got any weighting in your graph, and if not, uh, could project in the graph down to be a weighted graph. Be a way that you can you kind of lessen the size and make this applicable to people who haven't got your relationship with AWS. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I yeah, because currently it it doesn't actually have like uh, have a specif specification about the weighted. So all the weighted is actually learn it automatically when we actually train the graph. So um, it's a little bit greedy at the moment, but it's like. Um, Maybe it's like it's really difficult actually to define the weighted for as an initial because when we actually train the convolutional like graph neural network. Sorry, I didn't mean the the weights on a model. I mean okay. the weight on the graph itself. So say you've got a relationship between um, oh uh, a collector, a whole set of specimens they collected, yeah. and the country in which they collected, where you can reproject the graph to drop out the specimen, uh, the specimen nodes in that path and just make it a weight between collector and country. So then you have a much, much smaller graph. You've, lo oh, you've yeah, lost some good. detail, but you've got some a smaller graph with weights on the on the links rather than... Yeah, this can be done. Yeah. Yeah, this can be done. Because actually this can be done by a really simple function in the uh, AWS ecosystem. So it's like we can always like shrimp and down slice them to a subgraph. And this is actually why we choose the graph like conventional network. Because like this can be actually projected to a, a smaller size of graph. So graph conventional network actually can have the ability to actually have subgraph to be generated from a larger graph. and Actually, another thing you can do is actually use this uh, ch children graph as an as a, a graph node in larger graph. So this is actually the ability about the algorithm. Yeah, Quentin.
Yeah, so I wondered, um, say you managed to uh, disambiguate 50% of the collectors, how does that translate into the number of specimens? And the reason I ask is because I think the very prolific, prolific collectors are really easy to disambiguate because there's lots of information about them. So I think it'll translate very well into the number of specimens you can actually color. Yeah, this is a problem that actually why I mentioned this when I presenting a lot of slides that if anyone like want to provide open source, please let us know. Because uh, the we actually because this this slide was a little bit more like for listing all uh, all the attributes from those three data set because I like, actually Wikipedia have uh, all even like most of like all of like the IPTIN ID, binomial ID, orchid ID, and things like that. But for herbarium, like the Harvard Index and the Bionomial, they don't actually have any link between them. So it's basically uh, unsupervised, like trying to match chains during those uh, those two open source data. So um, yes, it will actually have a case that like people actually have like better representation or well known that they will actually have better match to the specimen. And some of the um, collector that probably only have maybe one or two collections or some of the um, collector, they might probably that only have like maybe a really, really tiny number of specimens. It will actually be a, a little bit biased in the in, in our graph. And this is what we already noticed. And this is something that why we actually here for asking like if anyone want to contribute their like, data sets like to us, please do so. But thanks. Okay. Yes. Sorry, we're probably gonna be trapped out in a minute, I suspect. Um, I just wanted to say, so the intent with this is really to um, have an open service, not to just support the Natural History Museum's own effort, but actually to widen that as a service to other institutions too. And especially those that are contributing data, you know, have every right, I think, to use that service. Now, at the moment, we've got a particular relationship with AWS that allows us to pay for the cost of this. And we'll continue to do that. <clears throat> for the foreseeable future. Um, but it, it might be that ultimately we can not only support wider you know, international digitization efforts, but there are other knowledge products that can be produced from this graph too. And so there might be some interesting business models here which allow us to reap the rewards for making our data more accessible. And that's sort of the longer term vision about this. But just to say the intent is to keep it as open as, as possible and for others to be able to tap into those services. Yeah, Thanks. another comment like, is actually because like why we are here in the knowledge graph section is because like, the machine learning model itself is quite open to everyone using a knowledge graph. So we are quite happy to share, like, for example, our Luigi script like, to doing the data aggregation. And also like we are happy to chat with the machine learning model as well because knowledge graph itself, especially in our biodiversity, we always have a problem is our data is really huge, but quite a lot of like the knowledge graph, like uh, machine learning model are quite keen on a smaller data size of data set. And even those like uh, AWS themselves previously, what the uh, the larger scale, they actually have a knowledge graph model training on it. It was like just two millions like data points, but for a case, so uh, just a really trivial like POC that we already start with 10, mag 10 million like data points. So this actually, uh, we did actually have chance to chat with like some really uh, good academics like group as well. And they all think that's like the machine learning models like for our, our like planetary knowledge base will actually have great potential to actually uh, applied it to quite a lot of my real time, uh, re reality taxes. And this is something that machine learning uh, areas are quite keen on as well. So we are quite happy to open it. Okay. One more, maybe last question. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Um, given many collectors are authors of treatments as well is there any option to be able to extend into your model citations yeah it definitely can 
because like because like yeah the model itself is like uh because for currently just for PLC we only covering doing about uh the bot botanist collector just because like uh about like the specimen we are testing on is actually herbarium shit but we like this we would definitely migrate it to like uh different like uh, a little bit more wider in the future yeah Yeah, maybe just to briefly add to that. So I think this provides a framework by which you can add lots and lots and lots of other kinds of knowledge. Um, and so really, this is just the beginning. And although we just started with botany, and we chose botany partly because it's a slightly more curated uh, group with, you know, e slightly easier to tackle in many It's still pretty big. Um, and we can make a lot of progress there and we can pin a lot of other data off the back of this. So it's just the beginning. I think it's quite an exciting beginning. Okay. So thank you very much.